Hey there, Waymaker class. It's time again to study God's Word, and we're so glad to have you with us this morning. And uh, we're going to pick up in John chapter uh, 2 and verse 18, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, what John has to say about the Antichrist. And so let's, uh, let's turn to our text here and uh, begin our reading and uh, see what what we discover in God's word. So uh, looking at verse 18, chapter two of first John, he says, children, it is the last hour. <clears throat> and as you have heard that antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have come. By this we know that it is the uh, last hour. Okay, that's verse 19 or 18, I should say. So let's kind of go through some of this. He says, children, uh, it's the word pideon here. Um, it means literally little children. Uh, and that's how John saw his congregation, his children, uh, as, a, as the pastor, he was responsible for them. He says to them, it is the last hour. What, what does he mean it's the last hour? What is, what is exactly what he is trying to say here? Um, personally, I think that uh, what we find is that, that this last hour thing refers to the last day, so to speak. And so he is letting us know that we are in the final hours of humanity's uh, rule and reign on the earth uh, in, in that respect versus God's rule and reign. Of course, God has always been ruling. He is always reigning, but humanity has been given authority over the earth. And, uh, of course, the devil stole that, and uh, man still thinks he's in charge, but really he has uh, the devil running the show. Uh, we see this not only in our personal lives, but in our governments that are around the world that uh, do unjust acts. And so uh, within, within government, within their policy, within the decisions that they make, uh, Jesus said uh, in Matthew 24 that there would be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, James says, why is there strife among you? Is it not because of the lust of your heart? And so we see that the root of all of this comes down to the greed and the, and the lust for power, the, the lust and the desires to, uh, to be in control. Uh, and so we have to take care that, uh, that our desires and our, that we, that we're trying to fulfill are, are just and righteous uh, and that they're from God. And so he says, it's the last hour. And now he goes on and he says, uh, just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. And uh, the first place we see that, of course, is over when Jesus is talking in Matthew 24 within the New Testament in verse five, where he says, and many shall come in my name, uh, proclaiming to be the Christ. Uh, and he goes on within that narrative to say, don't believe him. Uh, and uh, we are told again in the end of the Gospels, uh, I think it's in Luke, and that, that this same Jesus, which was taken up from you, will come in like manner. So uh, Jesus says, if, he's, if they say he's in the desert, don't believe it. If they say he's in the city, don't believe it. Because Jesus is not coming back just through birth and uh, in, in the earth again, but he is coming from heaven. He is going to descend in the skies and he's going to come from heaven. This is the how Jesus is going to return. He's going to return in the clouds of God that were on Mount, um, Air, uh, in, on Mount um, Sinai uh, when he gave the Ten Commandments and uh, he is going to come down in such fashion and he is going to touch the ground with his feet and uh, destroy his enemies. So he says, many antichrists have come. And uh, in this verse, he goes on to say, by this we know. Uh, by this we know. Uh, it's experiential knowledge. It's uh, uh, we know because, and, and I have to think that John is referring to his own experience because John was there when Jesus went up in the clouds. He saw him ascend up into the heavens. And so 
he knows what he's talking about. He says, this we know, uh, referring to all of the disciples that were there on the ascent of Jesus into the clouds. He says, by this we know that this is the last hour, uh, because there have been many antichrists. Uh, they were there when the lesson was taught on the last days and the last hour. And so he is speaking from his own experience of what he knows. Uh, it's hard to convince somebody who has had an experience, that who has uh, uh, lived life for real. Uh, it is hard to convince them of any other truth than the truth that they know. And so when you have experienced the presence and the power of Jesus in your life, uh, as you walked with him for three and a half years, and you saw him crucified, you saw him buried, you saw him raised from the dead, and, uh, and then you spent 40 days and you saw miraculous God wonders, uh, and then you saw him ascend up into the clouds. It's hard to change that experience, uh, which the disciples had. We also have the testimony of their own lives, how that they went out and they preached the gospel. And every one of these gentlemen died a horrible death because of the gospel, because they believed and because they knew the truth. And that's why you can say, by this we know. We know because of our own experiential knowledge. We, we experience Jesus in our lives. And friends, it is important that we experience Jesus in our lives. And he goes on, he says, because of this experience, we know that this is last hour. Jesus told them that uh, part of the signs of his return would be that there would be many antichrists. Uh, and there have been many antichrists. Even today, there are many antichrists in the world um, that even claim to be Jesus. I mean, friends, it doesn't take long to do a, a Google search and you'll find many, many antichrist today. Let's continue. Verse 19, they went out from us. So I, I want to pause there for a second because we need to think about what he is saying. They went out from us. And so many of these current antichrists today uh, claim to be Christians at one time. They claim that they had come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But now we find the truth out. He says, it's interesting how he comes to, uh, to, to, to manifest. He comes to that word manifest. He says, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us, or they were not part of us in that sense. For if they had been, they would have remained with us. Uh, that word remain there uh, in the Greek is a, uh, is a um, perfect tense, which means that uh, they would have stayed with us and the results of Christianity would always be in their lives. He says, however, they went from us uh, that they might be manifested, uh, is what the Greek says, but uh, so that they might be manifested, literally is the Greek. Uh, we read here in this uh, uh, Christian uh, translation, however, they went out so that they might be made clear uh, that none of them belong to us. Uh, the Greek literally says, but uh, so that they might be manifest that they were not all, uh, that they were not all par a part of us uh, in that sense. And so the word manifest, and so the manifestation is, is that they manifested the works of the devil in their life. They begin to proclaim to be the Christ and to do the Christ work. Uh, when they are actually uh, not Christ at all. Now, we need to keep clear that uh, in our minds and in our hearts that we are supposed to be like Jesus. In fact, the word Christian actually means little Christ. It has that connotation, little Christ. It's a diminutive. And so we are the, be the little Christ, uh, but we are not the Christ in that sense. And so uh, from a from a perspective of witnessing to those within our families, our neighborhoods, our communities, uh, we need to understand that we may be the only Christ some people will see. So it's important that we uh, watch our behavior, that we watch our mannerisms, that we take care that 
we represent the living Christ in a proper and uh, appropriate way uh, because we can skew the message of Jesus. We can, we can bring confusion to the, to the body if we're not careful on how we behave as we present the gospel to those around us. And that means even in our personal character, there needs to be uh, uh, constant checks and balances within our lives to make sure that we are properly representing Christ uh, publicly and privately. Uh, so we need to be careful to do that because if we're not, if we're not, we're going to manifest that we're really not of Christ at all and that, uh, that we are really doing the works of the devil. And, and that's just as easy to do. There are many people in the church who proclaim to be Christians. They, they say they are, but instead they're sowing division. They're telling lies. Uh, they're doing many of the works of the devil. They're going around trying to see if they can get to the top of the pile or not and be the most important person in the church. Uh, they're looking for fame. They're looking for riches. They're looking for glory. They're looking for power. They're looking for all the things that will make them feel better about themselves. Well, friends, this was not the work of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus drew a crowd and they wanted to make him king, what's he do? He hides himself. He, he escapes. He refuses to be that individual that uh, assumes authority. He is uh, always speaking truth, not lies. Uh, and so he goes about, as we are told uh, in the book of Acts, he went about doing good, destroying the works of the devil, and not promoting them. And so we need to take care that we don't promote the works of the devil and that we behave in such a manner that we manifest Christ and not the, to manifest the works of the devil. Let's go to verse 20 here. Uh, verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. All right, this is going to be another interesting. You have an anointing from the Holy One. Uh, we need to remember that Jesus told his disciples, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. But he says, when I go, and we we, we know this from chapter uh, 17 of John and, and uh, the previous chapter uh, that Jesus tells his disciples, I will not leave you alone. But he says, when I go, I will send you a comforter, uh, one who is the spirit of, of truth. Uh, that's why John can say you have an, uh, the anointing of the Holy One. Uh, we need to remember that God is one, whether it's the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, they are one. We are told in the Old Testament, in the book of, Ex uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And the, the Hebrew word there is ahad. Uh, it means one. It's the same word used when we look over into uh, the creation of man. And it says, and the Lord God created the woman and the man, and they were one flesh, a hod again. Uh, and so we understand that a group can be one. They are one in species. The human race is one in species, a hod. God is one in spirit, in mind, in will, in desire, uh, and so we see this. He says, you have an anointing from the Holy One and all, and all of you know the truth. Why do we know the truth? Because we have the spirit of truth. And if we walk in the spirit of truth, uh, we're going to be just fine. Uh, what is the truth? The truth is, is that God sent his only son. Now, uh, we, we hear this, the word only begotten son. Uh, and we think of birth when we think about that, but that's not really the, the true meaning of that particular Greek word. That particular Greek word means the unique one, the, uh, the one of the only kind. He is of the God kind. And so Jesus is the unique son of God. And so he came and he died for our sins. He was resurrected. He ascended into heaven and he's returning it. This is the truth of the gospel, and we know the truth. He says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, 
but I've written to you because you do know the truth is what he's telling them. Um, and so he is reaffirming what they already, already know uh, concerning the gospel. And so uh, let's, let's go on down here. It says, he says, he says, because no lie comes from the truth. He says, I've written to you because you know the truth and because no lie comes from the truth. Uh, uh, these are, this is an oxymoron, if you think about it. To say that you are speaking the truth and then be lies is an oxymoron. Either there's truth, which is non-truth, or there's truth. The devil speaks non-truth. He, he speaks against the truth. Now, <laughs> that being said, we need to realize that the best lies are 90-some percent truth. And, uh, it's it's, it's kind of like rat poison. Uh, rat poison, if you just take the time to read the box, uh, rat poison is 98, it's this, 98% food, 2% poison. It's just enough poison to kill you. And that's what it does to the rats. And truth does not destroy, but truth brings life. It brings correction. It brings direction. Whereas lies bring destruction and death. Uh, Jesus said, I have not come to, uh, well, that's a different verse there. Let's see. Uh, what The devil is what I'm trying to, he comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy is what I want to say. Uh, but Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it in abundance. It's abundant life. It's abundant truth in the same sense. So he says in verse 22, he says, who is the liar? If, if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. And so that's the lie. The lie is, is that Jesus is not the Christ. Uh, and there are many religions that make this proclamation. Judaism does not proclaim Jesus to be the Christ. In fact, they deny him. They go out of their way to deny him. Islam is the same way. They deny that he was the Christ uh, and so on. Uh, and so we need to understand that within the Abraham religions, the only one that proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God uh, and the Christ is Christianity. Um uh, Let's go on down. It says, this one is the Antichrist. And so those who deny, they are of the spirit of the Antichrist. And so we know that John is saying in the beginning, we know that that's the last hours because the Antichrist, many Antichrists are being revealed. Uh, what were some of the other signs in Matthew 24? There will be wars and rumors of war. Well, it's this very accusation that brings those wars and famines and pestilence. And so he says, this, uh, this one is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Uh, we're told very clearly here uh, that if you deny Jesus, you've denied the Father. If you've denied the Son, you've, divide, you've divide, denied at the Father. So verse 23, he says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Jesus made it very clear that the only way the only way, and, and I know people get upset about this, they, they, they talk about how Christianity is so exclusive, and it is. I agree, it is exclusive. Unless you know Jesus Christ, you cannot know the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus is exactly like his Father. Um, and that shouldn't be a hard concept for us to grab if we understand. Uh, he who confesses the Son as the Father as well. And so if we have accepted Jesus, we've accepted God the Father into our lives. And because of that, we can petition the Lord for the needs of our lives. Uh, but if we deny him, there should be no expectation on our part that we should receive any good thing from God. And yet God is still good enough that he blesses the good and the righteous as well as the evil and the wicked. He says he causes his rain to fall on both the good and the evil. What a gracious God. And God's call is going out to all the earth, to all humanity, crying out to all, 
Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus desires to save all, but not all know Christ, and thus they do not know the Father. Well, friends, that's our lesson for today, and uh, we just pray that that uh, the Lord will be with you today, and that he will bless you, and that he'll cause his face to shine upon you, and that he'll grant you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And until next time, God bless you, and I encourage you, walk in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until next time, bye-bye.